instruments that can be um, effective system. One of the things that we began to look at as we were involved with the Anna Casey Foundation and, and, and later through involvement with the Casey Family Programs on, on their disproportionality series, breakthrough series on disproportionality, was beginning to look at our data around children of color in foster care and throughout the system. And what we found out was that African-American children are two times as likely to be in our department. Um, in 2009, 43% of all our referrals were African-American children. And that actually was up from, from 2006 when it was 36%. When we began to dig, dig deeper into the uh, data and look at reporting source, what we saw that was that we also saw differences in uh, who was reporting and the proportion of um, African-American children. Uh, the school system reported more African-American children and was the highest reporter for, for Jefferson County. Uh, you see the difference in terms of the police and courts and medical providers. But it kind of helped us to begin to look at where do we need to focus our efforts in terms of educating them about referrals and, and people that are mandatory refer referrals. Um, as we looked at other disproportionate experiences in Jefferson County, we saw that 41% of our substantiations were African American children, where 57% were white children, 48% of our children that entered foster care were African American children. And, and significantly, 57% of our children who had a permanency goal of emancipation. And what that means is that they basically grow up in foster care and leave foster care without a permanent home. That they don't get a, an adoptive home hasn't been identified, and they don't return home to parents. That 57 of those children that exit foster care uh, with a goal of emancipation were African American. And that is something we continue to struggle and to try and work on every single day, but it's a major issue for us. So with the work through the Breaks and Series Collaborative, we began to look at small tests of change that we could begin to implement that would, be, would affect the um, disproportionality in Jefferson County. And, and looking at a team approach, we included a birth parent, a youth who had aged out of care, uh, of rep reports from representatives from the court, child welfare staff, and other community partners that help in our planning. That is when our, our first exposure to undoing racism began, and we began to send some of our leadership staff to the undoing racism training. Um, our deputy secretary uh, attended and was our executive sponsor for this work. When we looked at how we wanted to implement undoing racism in our community, we wanted it to be a, a community-involved project. And so it wasn't just the child welfare system, but really included all of the partners that, that um, I talked about school and courts and, and um, the um, uh, mental health centers, you know, juvenile justice, all of those partners were involved, as well as community and families. We looked at community partners funding the workshops. We received grants from the Apollo Foundation, looked at Metro United Way funding. Uh, we have a um, Center for Health Equity, which is part of our health department, uh, our Metro Council. All of those partners not only sent staff to participate, but also uh, helped with the funding. And over a thousand community partners have been trained in ten year, in three years. And this is just a, a list of some of those partners that have been involved. The other thing, because we knew how critical it was to be able to share the data, we started from the beginning to try and evaluate the effectiveness of the trainings. And so uh, through a partnership with our <coughs> university, University of Louisville, uh, we had, we evaluated the um, satisfaction and effectiveness of each training by surveying participants. And overall, you know, what we found was, was that the participants were very satisfied with the training, they felt that, that it, it did produce positive attitude changes, that there were the uh, participants of color were more set aside than those of the white participants. But it, again, it was often very first exposure for participants that, that were Caucasian. Um, Pre-test and post-test showed dramatic increases in, in correct responses, um, as well as uh, 
participants became aware about institutional racism and uh, white privilege. The majority of the participants who responded you know, said they expected the training to impact their practice and their personal relationships. And so they, it really did raise their awareness about racism and, and the impact on the child welfare system. And one of the things that we made a particular point of emphasizing is that the child welfare system is a community system, that it isn't just child protective services. And this uh, drawing kind of depicts that in you know, making sure that the whole community realized that they were all part of both the issue and the solution. We trained um, the community partner staff and our staff and residents. We worked through community forums to build awareness and promote community action. Um, we developed an advisory board which continues to work to own the initiative and that has been tremendously um, helpful because there has been there during this period was a change in administration in, in Kentucky. And so because the community owned this work, you know, the community was able to continue to move forward the work and, and advocate for the continuing of the work. Uh, some of the other practice change were changing worker practice through using the family of families uh, strategies and principles. Uh, and and uh, Joyce has talked about some of those, you know, the, the neighborhood-based placements, the you know, focusing on services in neighborhood, placement of children with relatives and kin, uh, working with families through team decision making, uh, looking at efforts to involve uh, community partners that hadn't traditionally been involved in serving their families through contracts and grants. Um, there was a commitment to diversity in hiring and cultural competency. One of the things that we started early on in hiring new workers is we put two questions on our interview um, questionnaire for, for new workers. And one of those questions was related to poverty. What do you think causes poverty? The other question started off with a you know, description that we were in the process of becoming an anti-racist organization. And we asked that um, applicant to describe a time when they've experienced or, or seen racism in action. And so it really helped us to, to begin to, one, share our vision with, with new applicants, but two, to get their perspective on you know, how they look at families and how they look at the system. Uh, we expanded our use of our parent advocates, and, and Teresa will talk about that, and in, in terms of working both with staff and community partners. The parent advocates that we train, we train them with workers and with foster parents. So they're all together, uh, sometimes for the first time, talking about their experiences, sharing information, and learning about how to work together as a team. Uh, we hired youth advocates to give input into decisions and to support youth in care. Uh, we're coordinating efforts with our Department of Juvenile Justice, who's doing work around disproportionate minority confinement, and uh, we, as, as many of you, I'm sure, as well, deal with kids, crossover youth, who are involved with both systems, so we're coordinating the work that that we are doing with those. We made intense efforts to maintain children in their homes by safely reducing the number of uh, kids and safely reducing the number of kids in foster care uh, through in-home services to families and looking at the data and in terms of where African American families being referred for in-home services. Um, we have all of our contract agencies report data by race and also uh, utilizing kinship care um, in Kentucky uh, we are able to provide financial assistance to relatives who uh, uh, provide homes for children that are you know, involved with the system. And at this point, we have twice as many children in kinship care than we have in foster care. So relatives have really stepped up and are caring for those children and maintaining their connections with families. We wanted our uh, providers, you know, health therapists, to really understand the historical context that uh, families of color come to them with. And so we sponsored um, effective black parenting training of trainers in the community, and 25 providers were trained. And um, those, uh, which, and, and that curriculum really focuses on the historical perspective and issues around self-esteem and dealing with racism uh, for parents who are raising their children of color. So, narrowing the gap, the progress has been slow. 
Um, I won't tell you that it's been easy because it absolutely isn't. It's an uphill battle every day. Um, as, as Joyce talked about, it really does take having courageous conversations. It takes speaking up when maybe you better not, or you know that it's not going to be uh, welcomed, or that you know that there's an issue that has to be raised. So what we've seen is that there has been a 2.5% reduction in African American children with substantiations from 2005 to 2009. Um, there's also been a 5% overall reduction in children in out-of-home care. Um, exits from out-of-home care. There's been a 15% increase in African-American children adopted. And we're very, very proud of this. And one of the things is, is one story just to share, um, last year in 2009, on National Adoption Day, we have a project with our court where we have a, a large amount of families that become fairly families with children or finalized adoptions on that day. And one of a significant number of those uh, adoptions were youth 16 and over. And uh, one of the adoptions was a 17-year-old who had a child while she was in care and the family adopted the 17-year-old and she brought a child with her to that home. And so it, I think it for both courts and for staff, it was a very vivid um, picture that there is no child that, you know, that cannot, cannot be a permanent home for it. And you don't stop looking when kids uh, turn 16. Um, there's also been a 4% increase in um, unifications between, um, in one year between 2008 and 2009. Parent engagement has been a tremendous uh, key to the work that we've been doing. One of the strategies that we implemented last year and are continuing is anytime there is a substantiation of an investigation, a, along with the substantiation letter, a flyer is sent to the parent tell, inviting them to a parent orientation. And the parent orientation basically covers what the child welfare system is about, what the court system is about, you know, answers any questions they may have. And, we, and that um, training, that orientation is done by a parent advocate, a, a uh, child welfare worker, and someone from the court. We even have judges that participate in that. And um, we have, um, we do it twice a month, once in the morning and once at, uh, at six o'clock so that parents can come, you know, based on their schedule. And we've had a uh, good response. It was slowly starting, encouraging the parents to come. And one of the things that the parent advocates did was they will make a call to that parent and personally invite them to come to the orientation. And that has been very helpful in you know, connecting with them and letting them know that this is an avenue for you to get questions answered to better understand the system. Um, with our parent advocate program, 70% of the children that they work with uh, were unified compared to 56% of those who did not have a parent advocate. Um, I mentioned the uh, effective back parenting and that the uh, community members are now trained to uh, present, it, present that. And then we also began to give small mini grants to faith-based organizations to do that training as well. And then we're working with a partnership with the school system to focus on truancy because what we were saying was that, uh, particularly for the older youth, they were coming, becoming committed to our system when they, they come back coming to our attention through truancy and courts were then committing them to the end placement for placement in foster care.